Hey, what's up, guys? Hello, it's with Football Talk here. After going through the rosters of all 32 NFL teams, as I was breaking down the biggest remaining needs for every single squad, I've really been grinding tape on those young players that have caught my eye. I just thought we were in a good position coming into 2020 because of changes to the roster or the coaching staff, maybe some schematic advantages that I saw for them. Well, I just really like coming out of college. And with those guys, I just wanted to evaluate them a little more closely and give my analysis of them. So for this exercise, I looked at players heading into the second or third season respectively and who I believe will take that next step in 2020. Some of the criteria for me was none of them were allowed to have made a Pro Bowl already, reached a major milestone statistically, such as a thousand yard season, double digit sacks or anything like that, or I just looked at already as some of the better players at their position respectively. I also left out players that already made my list last year, like a Kamoko Ture, the edge rusher for the Colts, or Justin Reed, the safety for the Texans, who I think already is one of the better young safeties in the league. And I thought they must have at least played a little in the league, which excluded guys like Jonah Williams, the former Alabama tackle who was drafted in the top 10 by the Bengals, or Hakeem Butler, who I liked a lot as a receiver coming out of Iowa State, as now with the Cardinals. Let's see how he becomes a part of the mix, maybe with DeAndre Hopkins also being brought in, uh, but that's a topic for another day. And I also only put one top 10 pick on offense or defense together, since I thought those were the obvious candidates anyway, and I didn't want to talk about them if it's mostly about injuries holding them back and not being able to stay on the field because of that, or whatever it may be. So now, today we're going to start with the offensive breakout candidates, and next week we're going to come back with the defensive edition of this episode. So let's get right into the list, and the first guy I want to be talking about is Drew Locke, the second year quarterback for the Broncos. A lot of people are already talking about this Broncos team, hyping it up, and their young single caller. And I'm a guy myself who has been talking a lot positively about this team, and Locke in particular. So pretty high expectations, I would say, for this team compared to other years. But did you know that Dan was actually 3-6 and six last year before Drew Locke took over in the starting lineup? They went 4-1 and one the rest of the way with the rookie signal caller throwing for just over a thousand yards, seven touchdowns, just three interceptions. And you saw him really actually push the ball down the field, not just do what the coaching staff tells him and take those check guns and whatever. 13 of his 100 completions went for 20 plus yards and he was responsible for 59 first downs, including rushing. When you look at what this front office has done this offseason, the focus has really been uh, putting pieces around Locke, whether it's the first round pick Jerry Judy, a super skilled route runner who will jump in right away as the wide receiver two next to Cortland Sutton. Then you bring in the second round KJ Hamble, the speedster out of Penn State, who has those jitterbug qualities and can just get loose in the open field. And then you got Locke, one of his former targets at Missouri, in the long striding, tall, fast Albert Equipenum. You throw that into the mix with Sutton, last year's first round tight end Noah Fant, dynamic duo of backs with Philip Lindsay and now Melvin Gordon, and you have a really incredibly talented group of skill position players. However, not only that, I thought the Broncos also really improved on the interior of the offensive line, with Dalton Risen already from last year, a very good second round pick will be a fixture in the starting lineup for a while. You throw in Graham Glasgow now, being brought in via free agency from Detroit, and a steal in the third round with Lloyd Cushenberry to send out LSU. I really like what they are building. Plus, Juwan James is coming back, who was a free agent signing for them at the right tackle already last year. There's a lot to like about the pieces around Locke. And then you look at the new offensive coordinator, Pat Shermer. I think he will make things easy for Locke, putting in more of a spread system similar to what he ran in college. Because when you look at the Giants last year, where he was the head coach, they used 11 personnel on 74% of the snaps. Then we also traded away the fullback, and Janovich. And I can already see uh, what Sherman is going to do with him. Give him a lot of easy completions of mesh concepts, screens to his backs, and then also draw up bootlegs, where you already see Locke do a really good job being able to throw on the move when you can bring in those two tight ends, give a run look, but give those bootlegs where you have everybody going one way at different levels and give him options that way and just build a system around Locke that he can feel comfortable in. I thought as a rookie, he already showed tremendous signs. And when you look at the quarterback landscape in the AFC, in terms of pure arm talent, the only guys I would maybe put above Locke at this point is Josh Allen from the Buffalo Bills, and another guy in Locke's division who's pretty good himself, and Patrick Mahomes. Watching his tape, you see Locke being able to get the ball to his targets without even being able to step into some of the throws because the rush is approaching. 
And what I really like about him is he consistently keeps his eyes downfield rather than looking down on the rush and finds creases to operate in the pocket. Definitely some things he can still improve upon, but he has that mindset of wanting to push the ball down the field, make those big plays. Looking at the five starts he had last year, you look at him in his first game as a starter against the Chargers. He immediately gave that offense some much needed juice. They were just the week before held by Buffalo to only three points. And then the week after that, the Broncos travel to Houston in a game I think everybody expected them to lose. And Luck just went out there and just threw darts all over the field. Led them to five scoring drives in a row. Four of them were touchdowns. And at the halftime, they were already up 31-3. to three. Yeah, they got some help from the defense as well. But Luck just made some big plays. Gave his receivers a chance to make something happen after the catch. And from those five games, the only really bad one I would say was at Kansas City, when it was really a snowstorm and he still needed to adjust, just didn't seem quite right. But overall, I didn't think there was really any other bad performances other than that. However, what I do think he needs to improve upon a little is mechanically, I think what he doesn't do quite yet is bring that back leg through to maximize rotation. And he becomes a little bit too much of an arm throw at times that way. Also as a rookie, I thought he got stuck on his primary receiver a little too much at times. But I think if he understands how to utilize all those new pieces, just get that offense rolling, that system under Sherma, I expect him to make a big sophomore jump. He is one of those plays from his rookie campaign uh, that kind of show off the skill set that he does have. The Broncos are faking zone to the left, booting to the right. And as you see, you have those different levels here. You have the tight end slipping underneath, somebody at the second level, then a post over the top. And you just see him throw off that wrong foot. Perfect dart to the sideline. Watch from the end zone view again. Fake zone to the left, booting to the right. And there you can see it off the wrong foot. You have the receiver streaking here and underneath the fender. So you have to put it over the top of him and towards the sideline. So it don't allow that safety to chase him down from behind. Pretty much a perfect ball. The next guy I want to be talking about is another second year player, Miles Sanders, the running back for the Philadelphia Eagles. And I wasn't sure if Sanders actually would qualify here since I believe he kind of broke out already in his rookie campaign, but he didn't fit any of the criteria I set for myself. And I just believe he will go from more of a splash player, maybe as he's seen now, to true superstar this season. As a rookie, you look at it, Sanders already picked up 818 yards on the 179 rushing attempts. And he caught 50 passes for over 500 yards, giving him an average of 5.8 yards per touch. And he reached the end zone six more times. Early on in 2019, he didn't really get those opportunities that you would like for him for such a dynamic player. Jordan Howard was the guy who actually was more of the lead back. Got 40 more carries through the nine weeks he was available for. But as soon as Sanders really got the opportunities that he should have, uh, you saw that ability average 1.2 yards more than Howard per touch. And he produced 8 compared to the veterans, 2 plays of 20 plus yards only. And don't get me wrong, Howell's a really nice back. And you saw what he can do behind a pretty good interior free they had in Chicago when he was there. He can be very productive, makes good decisions, tough runner, shows nice power and feel for the position. But Sanders, that kid could be special. Coming out of college, he reminded me a lot of his former teammate at Penn State in Saquon Barkley. And before anybody goes crazy here, Obviously, I do realize Saquon is bigger, stronger, just more freakishly athletic. And he was a generational prospect, so I'm not directly comparing him. But stylistically, when it comes to elusiveness in space, the balance he showcases, I think Sanders uh, is one of the better guys at those two things. When I look at the young backs in the league, what really sticks out with him as well is that feel for space, setting up blockers, and that really shines in the Scream game in particular. He's a true threat to the edge on those wide zone plays, but at the same time he shows patience, being able to stay behind the line of scrimmage when they run inside duo, power plays, all that kind of stuff. On those kind of plays, you routinely see defenders end up on the wrong side of the block and him being able to cut underneath it and make things happen. You look at that Philly offense from a year ago, they really lacked firepower ever since Deshaun Jackson went down early in week two. And then you compare it to this year, they draft Jalen Reagan first round, they trade for Marquis Goodwin, bring in a couple other speedsters later on in the draft. There's just so much speed being added to that unit, and that was really a big part to how Roseman's offseason. The Eagles will still run quite a bit of 12 personnel, just because they have Zach Ertz and Dallas Gardas, who are very talented players. But those two are both more than just 
but those two are both more than just viable blockers and they can be flexed out wide and possibly take a linebacker with them, indicate coverages for the RPO game, do all those kind of things. So it should present a lot of light boxes for Sanders to run into, especially if you have Rager outside on the opposite side, you have Deshaun Jackson on either end of the formation. That just forces the defense to keep two safeties high. And if they don't, uh, they're going to punish them pretty quickly. And you will see those boxes become softer and softer for Sanders as the game goes along. When I go back to my evaluations of Sanders coming into last year's draft, I had him as my fourth ranked running back. And I'm going to read you my final statement on his analysis here. I think he would benefit from being part of a committee early on, where he learns some of the subtleties of the position from a veteran, and he can really shine from year two forward. That's exactly the situation he's in right now. So he's ready to go, and I believe he will be one of the premier two-way backs in the league this season. Here's a play from his rookie campaign that really shows off Sanders' ability to be dynamic in space. He have a screenplay being drawn up, with Jason Kelsey being the only blocker to get out in space. Sanders catches the ball behind of it, uses the one blocker, utilizes him, cuts across the grade, you see the defender on the ground, gives another shake to the outside, gets to the sideline. Big play for his offense, watch it from the end zone view once again. So again, you have Kelsey coming out right away, pretty much. So Malo, I think it is, he's going to come late. Utilizes the first block, already peaks downfield, cuts inside, sees that second block in his peripheral vision, allows him to get to hide here, and cuts back that defender you see falling to the ground. Another one gets to the sideline, big play once again. And that's what he can do for you. Another back I like quite a bit coming into year two, and I actually had a head of Sanders, he was my number two ranked running back coming into last year's draft behind only Josh Jacobs, David Montgomery. What he showed at Iowa State in terms of contact balance, the rate of forced missed tackles, his pass catching production. I liked him a lot. I thought his skill set would translate really well to the next level. In his rookie season in Chicago, however, was kind of underwhelming. Only averaged 3.7 yards per carry. But when you look at the situation, considering Mitch Trubisky not providing any help, threatening the defense as a passer, a lot of penetration being allowed by the offensive line in the run game. That number looks a lot worse than it would have on most other teams, especially considering Montgomery picked up 2.33 yards of those 3.7 per carry after contact and he had to force 47 missed tackles. The amount of times he was contacted at or behind the line of scrimmage, had to spin out of the grasp of a defender, find an alternative route to get through, it wouldn't lead to a lot of success for any back really. Then you look at his contributions in the past game, bringing in 25 of 35 targets for just under 200 yards and a score. He's played soft hands with only two drops on the year. And he actually averaged 1.6 yards more than his teammate Tariq Cohen, who's more of a scat back, and actually dropped nine passes himself. That production isn't too shabby either for a guy who isn't really looked at as a space player by a lot of people at this point anymore. To me, Montgomery has the looks and the game of a true workhouse back, thick build, ability to absorb contact, and surprising elusiveness. He can really make things happen with the ball in his hands and defenders corralling him. You look at really good short area quickness to manipulate secondary defenders by pressing the line of scrimmage and then cutting behind a block or just bursting through a crease then. You even see him jump over the feet of his own lineman at times to get through a crack if that's what he sees. As a receiver, he was used primarily on swing routes to bind defenders in the flats, but he was pretty successful as well when he was allowed to get downfield on seam routes. You look at the Bears interior free, they really struggled for large stretches in 2019, with Carl Long being out most of the year, and then James Daniel, who's still adjusting to the guard position. Long has since retired actually, and while I was never a huge fan of Jermaine Fetty during his time in Seattle, when he had to play right tackle, putting him inside and purely based as a run blocker, I think he can at least be an upgrade over what they had at right guard over Rashad Coward in the games that he actually had room to get going for Montgomery against the Chargers in one of the games against the Vikings. He did reach over 100 yards and really produced when he was given the opportunity to be able to stay on the field and build some momentum. And then you look at some other games where the stat lines weren't overly impressive. They used him to sulk away some games and asked him to actually reduce that yards per carry average by just handing him the ball in those situations where the defense already knew what was going to happen. Obviously on that offense, you still have Tariq Cohen and his abilities as a space player, 
But the numbers weren't very impressive for him last season, actually, when you look at the poor touch numbers either. And I think if the Bears want to get back to what they did in 2018 with that dominant defense and a complementary offense compared to what they are trying somehow to be Kansas City when they don't have the players to be, I think they need to run the ball downhill. Montgomery's the guy who can get that run game going. Chicago didn't add a single running back in free agency or the draft, so that just tells you the confidence they have in their second year player and how they also think he could break out in year two. Here's a play from the Eagles game last year for Montgomery, already had caught a seam route in the previous possession for a big gain. And now you have him here, what basically is an ISO play. You have 81, one of the tight ends who is put in the fullback position. You have him leading up into the hole on number 54. Have the backside guy climbing to the linebacker. You see him cut behind that. Have actually take a little leap, make a man miss, and then drive ahead uh, the right way to finish runs. Watch it again from the end zone view. Once again, you have 81 leading up into the hole. Backside guard is sealing off. On the combo block, you're working up to the mic. Montgomery sees it very well, sees the little crease, and it's not a lot. You see it here. That's It only opens up here, but you see him adjust, jump over those legs of the interior blockers. And then you have 27. Malcolm Jenkins, actually one of the better tacklers in the league, makes him miss. Then you see that second defender coming from the side. He already lowers that shoulder, drives ahead for another five or six yards after contact. That's the type of attitude you can bring to your offense. Let's get into some receivers. And the first guy I want to be talking about here is Darius Slayton for the Giants. And he had a really interesting rookie campaign because in two years as a starter, actually, Slayton caught only 65 passes. But he averaged 20 yards per grab and scored 10 times over that stretch. So he was already known as a big play receiver. And the Giants only made him a fifth round pick. And he had a couple of those big plays early on as a rookie. But at some point, people started to realize that he wasn't just going to be one of those guys who can come in and give the offense a boost with a play or two in a game. Instead, I think he can actually be a full-time contributor at the receiver position. Slayton did disappear in a few games, way caught just a pass or two. But then he will come back the next week and take a couple of slants to the house from midfield or go over the top of the defense. 32 of his 48 catches last season, so two thirds of them went for first downs, and 12 of them resulted in 20 plus yard gains, as well as scoring 8 times in the process. He earned more and more trust from the coaching staffs as the weeks went along, and he played at least 70% of the offensive snaps in all but one of the final 11 games of the season, while recording passer rating right around 100 over the first season. As a route runner, Slayton uses different speeds to his routes, forces defenders to open up the hips with sudden bursts, and then has that ability to snap off his routes whether it goes inside or outside, and basically one step. He already runs a beautiful slant route, which I will show you in a bit, where he uses what's called a V-release technique against inside shading corners, selling the burst to the outside, then hitting a violent step and snapping his head around as he breaks back underneath the defender. And then once he has the ball in his hands, he has that speed and ability to beat the safety, come across his face, and outrace him to the pylon if given the chance. I also like the way he plucks the ball away from his frame and his feel for finding open space. What he still does need to improve a little bit upon is adjusting routes on the fly deeper downfield, being more effective on those. You look at Slayton at Auburn when he was just a junior, he almost exclusively lined up in the slot and I could see the Giants move around the second year man a little more, put a little more on his plate since he only played less than 5% of the offensive snaps lining up inside as a rookie. Slayton won't turn 24 until this upcoming season concludes and there's still a lot of room to grow for him. Number one being eliminating some of those focus drops, had five of them last season. A game that really stood out to me, one of his more productive outings against the Jets when Slayton caught 10 passes for 121 yards and two touchdowns. Jets defensive coordinator Greg Williams gave the rookie so much respect that he actually had Jamal Adams in all-pro safety shadowing over the top of the corner Slayton was matched up with and even tried to play some mind games with Daniel Jones, showing blitz with the safety and then retreating late to force the quarterback to hold on to the ball and to the rush could get home. To have a veteran defensive coordinator give the rookie so much respect, that really speaks volumes to me. A play that I already referenced with Slayton here, running that slant route against the corner. You see him, I show him here with the pointer. Takes that outside release, shows the burst, then violently hits that outside step. 
cuts underneath the defender, you see him falling down. Safety gives him a little move and outraces him to the opposite pylon. Watch it from the other side again. What he does once he has the ball in his hands. Like I said, that V release, showing that outside burst, then cutting underneath. And just what he can do with the ball in his hands once he gets going. You see him catch the ball over the middle, just give a little nod to the safety and win the battle to the pylon. The second receiver I want to talk about here, Marquise Brown of the Ravens. And coming into last year's drafts, I have Brown as my second ranked receiver behind only DK Metcalf, who actually was a late second round pick for some reason because people overthought everything and whatever, but he kind of broke out already. So I want to talk about Brown, who is actually the first receiver drafted and one of the only two combined with Nikhil Harry, who was the 32nd overall pick for the Patriots as the only two receivers to be drafted in the first round. In his rookie campaign, Brown caught 46 passes for just under 600 yards and 7 touchdowns in the 14 games he dressed for. However, similar to Slayton, there were some valleys and peaks. In the season opener, MVP Lamar Jackson and Brown dismantled the Dolphins secondary as the Rook went for 147 yards, 2 touchdowns. The following week, he had another 8 catches, but from that point on, he never reached the 100-yard mark or caught more than 5 passes the rest of the regular season putting up over 23 yards in only three of his final eight games. However, when the Ravens were upset by the Titans in the divisional round, this former Oklahoma standout was the only skill position player to really show up for the Ravens, had seven grabs for 127 yards. And you look at the success Lamar had throwing Brown's direction, recording a passer rating of 137.7 when targeted on the season, which ranked number one among all receivers with at least 50 targets. So when the MVP targeted the rookie, it led to great results. Brown was reportedly dealing with a foot injury the entire year. And while those off-season stories are overblown a lot of times when somebody starts a new diet and he's ready to take off or whatever, all of those stories don't really add up. And they're just stories as it says. But with Brown, he says himself that he had trouble walking normally at times. And to me that adds up with what I saw on film as I thought he just didn't quite have that burst off the line that really jumped out to me when he was in college still. And you can almost think of it as a great edge rusher trying to jump out of his stance and get upfield. If he can't get the jump and gain an angle on the quarterback, he will have to transition to a power move or find a different way to get to the passer. And with receiver, and especially Brown, that speed is a big part of his game and him being able to push upfield put the DB on his heels or even force him to open up his hips and then being able to dictate the route, that's a big advantage for him. And he just didn't quite have that his rookie campaign. However, Brown was already much more effective in the red zone than you would think for a rather slim stature with nine receptions from within the 20 yard line, 13th among all NFL receivers. And I think it's because he has a feel for how to avoid contact and is kind of slippery that way. When you look at Brown releasing from press, He's already much better than a lot of other receivers with bigger bodies and he may never be a great blocker simply based on that frame, but he does a pretty good job putting his body in front of defenders and shielding them to open a broom. Coming into his second season, Brown will have to add to his route tree and prove that he can stay healthy, but he only turns 23 next week, or is it this week? I'm not quite sure. He's turning 23 within the next few days, so the sky's the limit for this kid really. His rookie teammate from last year, Miles Boykin, is another one of those guys who I think could make a big jump in his second season as well. Ravens brought in a few receivers in the draft to go along with it. So expect one of the better offenses last year already to have even more weapons, maybe even more productive potentially, if Wilmar Jackson can keep this train rolling. Here's one of Brown's plays from his rookie campaign. You see him matched up in the slot with a safety. And the safety wants to play sort of a stack technique where he stays over the top of the receiver, forces him to go through him rather than just jump past him. And as you can see, he's even here already. Then he gains a step late as well and makes the play. You'll see it from the end zone view again. And just for context, this is a third and 11 play. You see the trust that the Ravens already had in Lamar, giving him the ball here on the third and 11 and asking him to convert, not just keep the clock running, but actually take away the game as the head here and the trust Jackson had in his rookie receiver was lined up in the slot out here giving him a chance in that play and finishing the game watch him here he's tracking the ball tracking the ball and then late hands 
gets it out the defender can't swipe at the ball anymore as you can see it's already secured nice play and that's the type of plays he can make for that ravens offense and with that we get to a third and final receiver for today deontay johnson of the steelers the division rival of the ravens and as i've talked about many times already that steelers offense was a mess in 2019 the quarterback play probably ranked dead last in the entire league without Ben Roethlisberger, James Conner, Juju Smith-Schuster were in and out of the lineup. And the concepts they were able to use with some young players were very simplistic, I would say. The one thing they had, that one glimmer of hope, was the third round pick out of Toledo. Johnson touched the ball 63 times for 721 yards and 5 touchdowns. Those numbers may not blow anybody away necessarily, but considering the situation he found himself in on the Dolphins, which was very stagnant for large stretches of games, having subpar passes. Those numbers are actually kind of impressive, I would say. Johnson had sort of a breakout game in week four against the Bengals, catching all of his six targets for 77 yards and score. And after that, he played at least two thirds of the snaps in all but two games the rest of the way. Altogether, he hauled in 91% of his catchable passes his way, and his 59 receptions actually led all rookies. In addition to his work on offense, Johnson averaged 12.8 yards per punt return, and he scored on one of his 20 attempts as a rookie down in Arizona. I think his ability to see the field, recognize defensive pursuit, and just move in space, it really tests opposing coverages um, as a returner, and that also becomes a problem once the defense tries to corral him with the ball in his hands on offense. I can't even count the amount of times Johnson was targeted on shallow crosses, off mash concepts, even in subverted long situations, and he just consistently made bigger plays than he should have with the defense already knowing what's going to come. His ability to hesitate, his start-stop quickness, that ability to just beat defenders towards the opposite sideline, it led to some almost impossible conversions, I thought, really bailed the Steelers' offense out. And Pittsburgh took advantage of how elusive and slippery the rookie was by putting the ball in his hands on end arounds, passes, quick screens, all that kind of stuff. Overall, he broke 18 tackles after the catch, which was second among all rookies on the season. And with all that being said, He's so much more than just a gadget player or anything like that. He's a super skilled route runner who easily gets off press and already shows a lot of nuance and deeper developing routes, I think. However, with how incapable those Steelers quarterbacks actually were, he just didn't have enough chances and got those opportunities to take advantage of his skill set. I love how he sets up his opponents, slow playing off the line, giving little head nods and just catching those guys off guard once he turns on those jets out of nowhere. You rarely see him give away his routes with his eyes and he really snaps that head around once he comes out of his breaks to get ready for the ball. At the same time, you just see him run right by some corners as he continues to fight with his hands as the defender tries to pin him into the sideline. So he has that in his bag as well. And he's a smooth glider on some double moves as post corners or out and up routes. The few things I didn't like about Johnson in his first year or things he still needs to improve upon he wasn't overly interested in getting involved as a blocker. His elbow, I think, gets a little too far away from his body, giving the fans a chance to punch at it. And he did drop six passes because his eyes had already moved downfield and he wasn't looking to catch in. So it will be interesting to see how Pittsburgh utilizes all their young receivers with Big Ben back on the center. I think all of them should receive a boost, but you get Juju back fully healthy. You still have James Washington, who went over 700 yards in his second season. And now you draft Chase Claypool in the second round, who's a big body guy, limited draw in college, has that size for the outside, but maybe better suited to play inside as well. So it'll be interesting how all those pieces fit together. There was quite a few plays I could choose from from Johnson, because you saw him, like I said, so many times just catch a shell crosser and there were things in the way and he needed to get around those obstacles to get to the marker. But I chose this play against the Cardinals where he's in a stack with Washington and he catches a quick screen and there's really nothing there. Watch him catch the ball here. You have a defender pinning from the inside and the outside. Almost impossible to do make something happen here. And he catches the ball and just runs right into the defender sees there's nothing there, but somehow he slips off it, reverses field, and you see the punt return ability, wanting to make the big play, slips the tackle here, and if Buda Bega is chasing his ass off to get to that opposite sideline, uh, he's going in for score. Watch it here again from the end zone view. I see you have man coverage, I think it is, the safety falling across. 
Here's Johnson. Peterson misses. He reverses field, beats everybody. And now that little move here, that little nod to the inside, slip away. And that's clearly the end zone here. If Buda Baker's not coming at a million miles per hour, that's a touchdown. So Johnson has that ability to make things happen with the ball in his hands, but much more than just a gadget player to me. Let's get to a one and only tight end on the list here. I chose Hayden Hurst, formerly of the Ravens, now with the Falcons. And this is also the only player on the list to have been traded while being on this rookie deal. So that may not necessarily be a positive sign, but when you look at what the Falcons did, how much they gave up, basically trading away a second round pick for Baltimore's number three tight end, it tells you what they think of Hurst. That may be a little bit of a simplistic way to look at it when you just say the Ravens traded away the third tight end to the Falcons for a second rounder, considering Mark Andrews is one of the true young superstars for the Ravens, and you have Nick Boyle, who may be the best blocking tight end in the league. Still, Hurst only put up just over 500 yards and three touchdowns through his first two years in the league, while Atlanta decided to not pay one of the better young receiving tight ends in Austin Hooper. Hurst has kind of been a forgotten man just because of how limited the production was in the Baltimore offense, but I did think he was the best all-around tight end coming out of college two years ago, and the Ravens believed him so much that they actually made him their original first-round pick before they traded back up into the first round and selected Lamar Jackson. The former baseball player and South Carolina standout was kind of underutilized in that Ravens offense, as I said already, since Andrews became the designated route runner, and Hurst was more used on simplistic duties as a pass catcher or executing kickout blocks in the run game. He was asked to learn those slip routes into the flats, off motions, or after faking swift blocks and whatever, or just on that wing alignment going right into the flats and creating a high-low stretch with the receiver behind him on like a curl route or something. And then sometimes he would turn that flat route right up into a wheel. But coming out in 2018, I thought Hurst was the most natural route runner in that entire class because of the way he could sink his hips and create separation against safeties when flexed out wide. But also having plenty of experience, getting his hands dirty is a true why. You look at the Falcons now with offensive coordinator Dirk Cutter, he loves to utilize the tight end, especially in a vertical nature, sending him down the seams. And you look at it already in Tampa, how he used both those two young tight ends. And then last year with Hooper, who finished just under 800 yards in only 13 games. I think Hurst can definitely fit into that role. His ability to just go get up the seams and shield the ball away with his body. Also the way how physically he gets after the catch. Those are things that will make him work in that offense for me because Matt Ryans will feel comfortable attacking the middle of the field and knowing what he can do after the catch. Really swap Hurst now for Hooper with those receivers in Julio Jones and Calvin Ridley around him was one of the better young receivers already himself. I could easily see Hurst put up six to 800 receiving yards and a few touchdowns that go along with it. While he didn't produce at a very high level in Baltimore for his first two years, he did average 8.9 yards on his 39 targets last season which is actually 0.2 yards more than Andrews, who was a pro bowler for the Ravens. Really get him downfield, similar to what they did with Hooper. And he could easily finish top 10 at the position in all the major categories. I wouldn't be shocked to see it. This is one of the plays where you can see Hurst, and what he can do after the catch. You see him in a true wide alignment to the left side. Boyle is in the backfield as a fullback almost. They motion him over. Have another quick motion with Willie Sneed from the slot. Then the fake zone to the left and have Hurst uh, slipping across here. He's trying to find some open space. Lamar throws him the ball into that window. You have the corner coming over, ready to put a hit on him. But he just bounces off that first hit, breaks another tackle, keeps the ball on the head. Very physical play. He gets fired up after it. Watch it again from the end zone view. The fake that zone play to the left. Jets are shifting late. He can slip across, Lamar gets the ball to him, and now, boom, comes off that hit, breaks another one, plows ahead. I don't think he actually knows where he's at at that point, but that's the things he can do for you, and he can also, like I said, get involved more vertically, make those things happen. Had another long touchdown last season against the Bills. He has that ability as a pass catcher, which he just wasn't allowed to showcase with the Ravens necessarily because of the other guys they have on that roster. 
And the last guy we get to talk about today is Frank Ragnow, the center for the Detroit Lions. And I really love both Ragnow and James Daniels, who's now in the Bears, who I expect to take another step as well next season, when they were coming out as the centers two years ago. On the other hand, I wasn't as bullish on Billy Price coming out of Ohio State, like a lot of other people were, and I feel pretty good about that right now. I actually had Daniel slightly ahead of the two, just because of that agility and the way he could reach defensive linemen, get that outside zone game going. But you look at Ragnar, I thought he was a little more physical for gap schemes, and he was better at the nuances at the position already. In his rookie season for the Lions, Ragnar actually started all 16 games at the left guard spot, and he already played really well, but then last season, they used him and Graham Glasgow, move both those guys one spot to the right with Glasgow now at the right guard spot and Drag now at the pivot. And he took another step already, allowing just two sacks and being called for holding just twice as well. Coming out of college, his coaches actually said he was as natural a sender as you're going to find back in 2018. And I agree that's where he fits his best, which I already said coming out as well. So now entering year three, I think he takes another step and establishes himself as one of the premier centers in the entire league. He's such a smart, scrappy player who will be the centerpiece for what those guys are trying to build in Detroit. And ever since I first laid eyes on Ragnar, the one thing that really stood out to me right away was his snap-to-step -step quickness. He can really get on the move and hook defense in his own run game, allowing his backs to cut it underneath it. On those type of plays, he really does a great job of setting up his teammates, not allowing that down lineman to still cut across the face once he gets off it, but at the same time transitioning to a point where he can still get to the linebacker and beats those guys to the spot routinely. And even if they try to overrun it, he gets to the backside and somehow creates a cutback lane still for his backs. In the past game, Detroit runs a heavy amount of half-line slides. We see Ragnar have his eyes up to the side he slides towards, uh, but they also have that help hand ready to not force his guards to have to overcommit as one of the A-gap defenders in the opposite gap um, rushes up field. And Ragnar's excellent at passing on assignments, on twists and other games up front. At times there are some issues with the really powerful nose tackles if he can't shoot his hands first. And something that I think he needs to work on is that he tends to stand up a little too much out of his stance. But I think he's in a better situation coming into year three now with two more consistent pieces around him potentially. With two of their draft picks in Jonah Jackson in the third round coming out of Ohio State. And then Logan Stenberg in the fourth from Kentucky, I project both those guys to make the starting lineup. And then you look at what the Lions are trying to build, selecting DeAndre Swift, 35th overall in the draft to go with Kerryon Johnson. This team clearly wants to pound the rock, grind away opponents that way, running zone schemes with that offensive line and allowing those two backs to just stick their foot in the ground and get upfield. That just gives them a recipe for success and what I believe is an identity. Swift and Johnson are also really good in the screen game, where Ragnar's ability to just choose appropriate angles, put hands on people in space, that can really shine in those areas. I actually chose to play in the pass game for Ragnar here. The Vikings show a double A gap pressure look, and they have six guys on the rush, which is tough to pick up against an empty look. Uh, the Lions keep a tight end in here, so they have enough guys to pick everybody up. But if there's any games being played up front here, they have to be perfect in communication. They pick it up. Give the quarterback enough time to complete the ball. It's a little on the throne. Uh, flag is thrown here as well. I think that's actually for pass interference. So they do pick up the first down. Once again, see what they do up front. Two linebackers in the A-gaps. We see Anthony Barr really rushing upfield, trying to pin Ragnar. And now with the left guard, they have to be perfect in communication. Getting that secondary looper. Ragnar puts his hands on him, puts him to the ground, and gives the quarterback time. Now let's get to a couple other names I considered here. First up, Daniel Jones, the second year quarterback for the Giants. Played behind a horrific offensive line, but now adding in Andrew Thomas for overall. A couple other mid-round linemen. He will have better protection coming into year two. And you look at Saquon Barkley, he will have a lot more room to run as well, which opens up those shots off play action. I already talked about Darius Slayton, how he could break out in his second season. You have Evan Ingram coming into year three, who... I didn't want to put up here because I don't think there's any question he's a very good player. He just hasn't been able to stay healthy. And while you can make jokes about Jason Garrett as the new offensive coordinator, I think he will make things easier for Jones as well. 
heavily counting on the run game and open up easy opportunities for him. Some stone replays potentially, where Jones has underrated uh, athleticism. As a rookie, he led the NFL in fumbles, not really because he just didn't put the second hand on the ball or anything like that. It was more to, to holding on to the ball, wanting to create plays, and he will have more protection, but he also has to learn how to live for another day and just give up on some plays at times. Another running back, I hope, uh, can finally establish himself in the league. Darius Guy is coming into year three. As a rookie, he showed some signs in preseason before tearing his ACL and then being missed for the entire season. And then last year, he got hurt after five games once again. However, through that stretch, he averaged 5.8 yards per carry. And I just loved him coming out. He was my number two back behind Saquon Barkley in 2018. Guys is a violent runner and has very natural skills for the running back position. Has a good feel for everything. And in that Washington offense, we're probably going to try to take pressure off Dwayne Haskins coming into his second season as well. I believe you will see a lot of those backs. They have a pretty full room now. But Guys is the most talented player for me as far as a pure running back goes. I think Antonio Gibson will be on the field quite a bit, who was the third round pick this year and has that slot receiver, running back flexibility, can make plays happen wherever he lines up on the field. But I think Guys is a true running back. He could be that RB1 for them if he can find a way to stay healthy finally. A couple more receivers here. Anthony Miller uh, for the Bears. As a rookie, he actually went just over 400 yards and seven touchdowns. Then last year, he caught 52 compared to only 33 catches his rookie campaign, but only reached the end zone twice. And a lot of that had to do with being part of a very static offense where he didn't get the opportunities he would have liked. But Miller to be has inside and outside flexibility. You can manufacture touches for him on jet sweeps, screens, all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, you can get him involved in the vertical game. You see the improvement already from first year to second year. Now losing Taylor Gabriel, he will take on some of that role as well. And I just believe next to Allen Robinson, he could clearly be that second guy, very productive, especially if Nick Foles is in the starting lineup and they try to get the passing game going a little more. The other receiver, actually an undrafted free agent last year, Preston Williams. He only played half the season before he was put on IR with a torn ACL. But up to that point, he led Miami with 32 grabs for 418 yards. He wins with sides and adjustments to the ball in the air, down the field. Of those 32 catches he had, 24 of them actually went for first downs. He produced six plays of 20 plus yards. And I think he will be clearly the number two receiver behind Devonta Parker. We will see how that passing offense progresses and at what point Tua Tagovailoa actually takes over. But either way, I think Preston Williams, if he's healthy for a full season, will be a major contributor. Now let's talk about a couple of tight ends here. My first one being Chase Sternberger, my fourth ranked tight end coming into last year's draft behind the two tight ends out of Iowa and TJ Hawkinson and Noah Fent and then Alabama's Irv Smith. All three guys who are primed to break out as well and take the next step into year two. Sternberger to me was a big slot and more of a move tight end uh, coming out of Texas A&M. But I think if he can improve himself as a blocker a little technically, he should be on the field quite a bit because the Packers, the only guy that re-signed at the tight end position is Mercedes Lewis, who's more of a blocker himself. They let Jimmy Graham walk. And now when you look at that receiving room, you have Devontae Adams, a bunch of other buddies who they are still looking to step up. I think Sternberger could get a lot of targets in his offense after he was pretty much a non-factor last season as a rookie. And the other one is Chris Hearn of the Jets, who I had as a top 10 tight end coming out of Miami two years ago. And he only played in one game last season, was suspended for, I think, the first six last year, and then got hurt right away as soon as he finally got onto the field. But you look at his rookie campaign, went for over 500 yards and four touchdowns, 25 of his 39 catches went for first downs, and he averaged 12.9 yards per grab, which is really high number for the tight end. He seemed to have very good chemistry with Sam Darnold as the quarterback, and now we are coming into year three. You have Ryan Griffin there still, who was pretty good for them filling in. But I think Herndon, if he can build up the report with Darnold again, he could be a major factor for this offense because there's a lot of unproven commodities in this receiving room. Let's finish up with two linemen here. Nate Davis being the first one. He was my number eight interior offensive lineman last year, coming out of Charlotte. Very powerful frame, has a lower body flexibility and agility. 
last year he was kind of thrown into the mix because of necessity when I look, thought he still needed a year to develop in the NFL. Had his struggles when he finally was on the field, but now as part of this Titans offensive line with a lot of road graders in the run game, I think he fits in perfectly. And if he can learn anything coming in from year one to year two, he should be a much better player and could be a very good guard in 2020. And finally, you have Isaiah Wynn, who I had a first round grade on, was a first round pick for the Patriots two years ago. I projected him to play inside, but coming to England with that kind of system where you get rid of the ball quickly, I thought he made sense on the edge and he fits that system pretty well. However, these last two years in week two was really a big problem for him. First he tore his ACL in 2018 and then this past season in week two, he got turf toe and overall played only in eight games in his second season. I still believe in his talent. Coming into year three, hopefully finding a way to stay healthy, having learned behind those other guys during that time, just focusing on the mental side of the game, I think he will be a pretty good left tackle for the Patriots. So that is it. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, I would really appreciate it if you could leave a like, subscribe to this channel, follow me on all my social media, which you can see linked down below in the description. Let me know some of the young breakout candidates you can think of in the comments. And I will give you my thoughts on them. If you're interested in more of my breakdowns, you can of course check out my other videos on this channel or head to my page littlesrulefootballtalk.com. I will be back next week with some of the young breakout candidates on the defensive side of the ball. So until then, see you later. Peace.